Hello and welcome to the Conflict Tipping Podcast from Mediate.com, the podcast that explores social conflict and what we can do about it. I'm your host, Laura May, and today I have with me Dr. Samantha Hardy, Conflict Management Specialist, Coach, Mediator, Director of CCI Academy and fellow Australian. Welcome, Sam. Thank you, Laura. Sam has her PhD in Law and Conflict Resolution and is a well-known trainer and university educator who has worked in Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, the USA, and an hour ago online in Ukraine. She is also a prolific author and reader, and I encourage you to follow her LinkedIn page for ongoing book tips and reviews. She's a transformative mediator and narrative coach, the founder of the Real Conflict Coaching System, and provides coaching, conflict support, and training to managers and leaders across the world. She's also recently created a fabulous new course on working with emotions in conflict. So Sam, today we're going to be talking a bit about emotions, narratives, and conflict. What led you down this pathway? Oh, that's a long story. I started out life as a lawyer. And then after about five years out of law school, I did a master's of law and I did a subject called alternative dispute resolution. This was in 1997. So quite a long time ago, showing my age. They had an opportunity for people who were interested in mediation to do an extra two days training and get what was then a certificate three in community mediation. For me, this course was just mind blowing. I was working in litigation. Suddenly I had experienced this way of talking with people, getting them involved in the process. It really was like an epiphany. And much to the horror of my friends and family, I quit my job as a lawyer and I decided I was going to be a mediator. But in 1997, you couldn't have a career in mediation in Australia. It wasn't really a thing. There were some community mediation centres, but you couldn't really make a living out of it. So being the nerdy kind of reader that I was, I decided I'd do the next best thing, which is I'd go and do a PhD on the topic. And I would really find out everything I knew about mediation and conflict and all of that sort of thing. So I went back and I started teaching in law schools and did my PhD. I started out looking at why people, when they went to court, weren't happy. And I was trying to figure out why mediation was better. And for me, it was something to do with their ability to talk about it and, you know, all the stuff that's in the canon of why mediation is a great way to resolve conflict. But I thought there's something to do with lawyers. I had it in my head. Lawyers are somehow ruining people and making them more adversarial and breaking them. So I was going to try and solve this problem. I went and interviewed all these people who had had what I called in a very technical sense, an injurious experience, and that they blamed somebody for it. Most of the people I interviewed thought I was a psychologist. I didn't tell them I was a lawyer. And when I say interviewed, I didn't really interview them. I was sat down with them. At the time, I had one of those little mini disc players, mm-hmm. like a mini CD to record. It was like the highest tech of the moment. I was so excited about that. So I'd turn it on and I would say to them, all I want you to do is just tell me what happened take as long as you like tell me what happened I'm not going to interrupt and I would just let them go and what people did was tell me a story most of them talked for around 20 minutes there was one or two that I had to stop because they were going forever but most people talked around about 20 minutes and at the very end the only question I asked them did you see a lawyer about this And my expectation was the stories of the people who had seen a lawyer would be different from the stories of people who didn't see a lawyer. And I did end up with two very distinct types of stories. In the end, I couldn't prove in any way whether the lawyer caused the problematic stories or the problematic storytelling people were the sort of people who would go to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I got into a chicken and egg situation there. What I did discover was this one very kind of dysfunctional way of talking about your conflict and this other group of people some of whom had had things much worse happen to them than the other group who had this sort of resilience and this capacity to grow from something that was quite harmful some of them had really bad things happen to them one guy had become a quadriplegic and yet told this story about how it improved his life so I was intrigued by that and then I started trying to figure out how am I going to describe these two stories how am I going to explain the difference between them and this is one of those weird serendipitous moments as well as doing my PhD and teaching at law school I was also studying a degree in French and French literature because that's what you do when you're a nerdy geek type person (laughs) I got the nerd credentials up I definitely do I was doing a subject on French theatre And we were reading the plays of a French writer called Pixericor. That's probably a very bad pronunciation. He was known as the father of melodrama. And Mm. as I was reading his stories, his theatre plays, 
I thought this is like the dysfunctional story. So many of the way the characters were portrayed, the way the plot was laid out, the moral of the story, they fit these mm-hmm. dysfunctional conflict stories. So I thought, okay, I've got my genre for that. I had to come up with the genre for the more resilient stories. And after looking at a lot, I ended up having a bit of a toss up between comedy and tragedy. Mm-hmm. The resilient stories fit the genre of tragedy. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't because they told a story of life sucks and then you die. It was that they understood the challenge they were facing. They were sort of on their own. They had to or they chose to manage it on their own. They took control. Sometimes they made the wrong choices, but at least they were making choices. And even if it didn't work out that well in the end, they learned something from it. They grew and developed as a person in some way. So that was sort of the beginning of my journey into conflict stories. Then The next step was, how do we make the shift? I mean, how can I help people who are stuck in this dysfunctional story move into a version of a tragic story with some resilience and learning and growth? That's where the real conflict coaching system came in. It was a process that I developed to help people make that shift. That's actually really a really good jumping off point, Sam, because I have been reading your book, Conflict Coaching Fundamentals, <laughs> Working with Conflict Stories. The second half of the book talks about what I call the six shifts that the story needs to make. They're really basic things like going from a position of simplicity or a story that's very simple into a story Mm -hmm. that's complex and nuanced, going Mm -hmm. from a sense of certainty into a sense of uncertainty. There's a couple of thematic shifts that we can make quite easily. We can support people to make it quite easily. Making this shift from really simple black and white type thinking into more complex thinking. I mean, that's something that can be quite hard to do though, right? That's something we suffer from every day. It's just our brain saying, let's take a shortcut. Let's make life easy. We need to worry about things like what to have for dinner, not about this problem, right? What would be the first thing you would say to someone in that kind of situation to get them out of this really black and white way of thinking? There's a couple of things to set in place first. It is a challenging shift to go from Mm -hmm. everything being right and wrong, very clear, certain. So you have to make people feel safe enough to become vulnerable, as Brene Brown would say. But there's a fine line too between going overboard and making the complexity so big and overwhelming that people can't function, can't move through it. So it's about finding a balance. There's a really good book called The Paradox of Choice that talks about that tension between choice is a good thing, but after a certain point, it becomes overwhelming and we lose the capacity to keep processing. One of the things as a conflict resolver that that can help a lot is just to ask lots of questions for detail for no particular purpose. So rather than what the getting to yes people would say is ask people about their underlying interests, drill down into their underlying needs and concerns, Yes, that's useful, but also what can be really useful is just asking for more detail, asking Mm -hmm. people for a little bit more context, a little bit more history, what happened in between the dramatic events that are part of their simple story to give it a little bit more balance. We typically remember more clearly the negative events and we don't remember positive events. If we're feeling negative at the moment because we're in conflict with someone, we can easily remember the negative events or the dramatic events. We find it harder to remember the neutral events or even the positive events. Just asking people for detail without any particular purpose, not pointing out inconsistencies, not reality testing, just getting them to fill in the gaps in a non-threatening, supportive way, people accidentally notice things that were there but they haven't been paying attention to, often because their emotions are filtering them. Fantastic. And you have given me a a good leaping off point to ask about emotions, (laughs) Dan, so thank you very much. Very considerate of you. So then what is the connection actually between this work you've done previously on these narratives in interpersonal conflict and your more recent work on emotions? What's the link there? It's funny, when I started doing the work on emotions, I hadn't decided that there was a deliberate link. They were two separate things that I decided were important and I wanted to explore and then I wanted to share with people because I thought it was helpful. But the more I've done the work, the more I realise stories like melodrama and tragic stories take us on an emotional journey. They have a purpose that's driven by emotional goals. The way we tell the story is driven by our emotions in response to the events, in the content that we access in our memories. We present it wanting an emotional response from our audience. If we want someone to rescue us or to 
you know, go into bat for us. We need to motivate them and we motivate people by triggering an emotional response. Motivation and emotion are from the same Latin root. So the purpose of our stories and what we want from our audience is heavily based on us getting an emotional response. And I guess that's the, the difference in those two stories. In a melodramatic story, we're aiming for an emotional response from an external audience, father figure in the genre, who we want to come and save us from our woes. In tragedy, it's about emotional learning and growth. You think about stereotypical tragic stories. The <laughs> hero has this emotional moment where it's often very confronting. Suddenly they realise something they really believed in or something they really loved and valued wasn't true, that it was wrong. And they had this emotional crisis, but it leads to them discovering something about themselves or the world they live in or how conflict works. The hero in the second story does definitely sound like a very emotionally complete and more mature human in some ways, right? <laughs> but imperfect. In tragic theatre, we talk about the fatal flaw. And that's the thing that sort of ruins their life. I think in our day-to-day -day tragic conflict stories, it's not, it doesn't have to be a fatal flaw. It's just some little failing or mistake that we make that, that in conflict can escalate and have ramifications far beyond the little thing that happened to us. It might be pride, our ego, our unwillingness to be vulnerable. There are a whole lot of little things that we might have in our makeup that might end up being the flaw that created or escalated the conflict. In melodrama, if you want to be saved, you have to portray yourself as perfect, mm -hmm. to be perfectly innocent and pure. So you yeah. are not even consciously aware of things that you've done that have contributed to the problem and you're going to be very resistant to going there because it's going to ruin your story your identity whereas in tragedy it's okay to be imperfect it's okay to make mistakes as long as you learn from it sometimes you learn too late and then life sucks and you die on the stage in tragic theater my goal is to work with clients before it's too late so that they can twist the ending instead of going to the life sucks you die ending we choose a different route and we turn it into something a little less tragic in terms of the outcome as you were talking about this idea of being a perfect victim it sort of reminded me of the literature i've read in victimology and i love that that's the actual field name victimology for example if you are going to court or if there is a violent crime for instance then unless the victim is perfect in some way, then it's less likely to go to court and then less likely to be that the perpetrator will be judged guilty. And of course, perfect in this case is not just completely free of any activity that might have led to their becoming a victim, but also what they look like and where they're from and what their education level is. So it can be quite difficult, I would say, to be a perfect victim. And so even if you're able to perform being a perfect victim for yourself, say, like, oh, no, we, I was absolutely nothing wrong in the situation. And when you're playing to your audience, they still might have a very different perception, as I suppose is exemplified in the so-called perpetrator in your melodrama, right? They're going to be like, no, 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 this victim ain't so perfect after all. When you have a conflict of stories, what happens is the bad guy in one person's story is the melodramatic heroine or hero in the other. There's a fight for who's the actual villain and who's the actual victim. So there's a fight to sort of besmirch each other's virtue as a way to get heard. The other bigger societal thing, and I know your work is much more on a social scale, whereas I tend to focus on individuals and maybe very small groups like families or workplaces, the question is who defines virtue? That can be a very, very challenging question to answer. Who defines the parameters of virtue? In classical melodrama, the virtuous heroine had to be of legitimate birth, a virgin and preferably yeah. beautiful. You and know, ideally and long they, hair for climbing up tower right. sides, right? Yeah, yeah. That's right. There are expectations of virtue that are very different from now. Now the expectations of virtue are often internalized we see ourselves as a good colleague or a generous person but there are social requirements of virtue if you're a rape victim for example were you wearing a short skirt and fishnet stockings mm. that shouldn't be a criteria for whether or mm. not you get raped mm. and technically it's not but it's still there underneath the radar so to speak absolutely and it's the sort of same story in terms of well are you white or not <laughs> and if you're not, if you're a person of colour, then you're less likely to be taken seriously when reporting violent crime against you. There's been a bit of Twitter and social media discourse these last few days about how 
this one chap was being basically bashed up by his girlfriend. That's probably not the proper way to put it. And so <laughs> he called the police and the police arrested him. And apparently, and I haven't done the figure check on this, if you're a male victim of domestic violence and you call the police, you're more likely to be arrested, at least in the US, because you're not a good victim, right? So you don't fit into the sort of social victim role. Absolutely. Virtuous behaviour differs for different people as well, even yeah. in what's appropriate in terms of a display of emotion. So there's a whole lot mm-hmm. of really interesting research about how it can be particularly risky for a person of colour to display anger in the workplace compared mm-hmm. with a white person. There's gender and cultural expectations about what emotions you're supposed to experience and how you're supposed to display them. And they're not consistent. It's quite interesting. Uh, just thinking about these broader social conflicts, I remember I read this really fascinating paper about Brexit, which is sort of like the US presidential campaigns can be, and have been known to be the recent past, So sort of this portrayal of one side as angry and irrational. What this paper talked about was, well, actually both sides describe them, you know, themselves as angry and the other side is angry, and they're both justly angry, but the other side is angry and crazy. Like, they make no (laughs) sense. They have no basis. Like, our anger is justified. Of course, we're fighting for truth and all that lovely stuff, Mm -hmm. but they're irrational. So it's really interesting that everyone's getting mad, but Mm -hmm. the other side aren't legitimately mad. Sarah Cobb and I many years ago started working on a paper. We didn't actually ever publish it, but we looked at the narratives, the sort of propaganda narratives of the US government and ISIS. And it was really intriguing to see that they were both, as you just described with Brexit, telling the same story, characterising each other as evil and trying to ruin our way of life. They were very melodramatic narratives of the other in the same way. Yes, we're angry, but we're justified. Exactly the same dynamic. This is what you were saying in terms of like, well, who wins the story? Who's the real hero? He's the real victim. Who's justly angry and who is not justly angry? They're very much intertwined, these narratives and these emotions. And I found it really interesting that you started from narratives and moved over to emotions. I actually went the other way around. In my research, I started with emotions. Post-Brexit vote, I was like, wow, all my Remainer friends are really sad, which is not the same emotion that was being expressed by Leavis. And then you had these ideas of Project Fear as the Remain campaign and Project Anger as the Leave campaign. But these were all deeply intertwined with the strategies and who was being talked about and in what way. The Leave campaign was very much portraying the EU as a villain. So you're allowed to get angry against them. The way I came to this word villain, which obviously echoes so close to your own work, is girls sitting there going, if I'm really angry at someone, what do I want to do? I want to call them something? How do I describe this relationship? And it took me a very long time to think of a word that was not a swear word to describe it. <laughs> it was like, literature will save me. The other side is a villain and not anything less appropriate to say on a podcast. Yeah. You just highlighted that very important difference that it's a completely different level to say you're wrong or you're morally wrong yes and once you have that the villain the moral villain part of it yeah then then there's there's no room for conversation you know you can have a conversation with someone who's wrong but there's also that saying you don't change someone's mind with information you change someone's mind by connecting with their heart and their emotions and you do that through a story through narrative you don't do that by giving them data data never really changed anyone's mind you have to tell a story that they can believe in and relate to it's sort of seems to this conflation of blame and name calling but to me one of these things is you did something bad and the other is you are bad which is what you're talking about here right yeah yeah. And we need to be able to disentangle those two. It's the same as saying, oh, you did something good or you are good. One can lead to the other. If you keep doing bad things, at some point someone's going to say, you know what, you might just be a sociopath. And that's the flip side of what we were saying before about how if you are the virtuous heroine, and I say heroine because in classical melodrama it was always a young woman. Obviously in modern melodrama it can be a man. Typically in the way the story is constructed, they're sort of emasculated. They have feminine attributes. So it's hard if you're a man trying to get support through a melodramatic story, it can feel very emasculating, which is often why men yeah, don't yeah. get support. But I'm getting off on another tangent. But the <laughs> way what we, what we were saying about the innocent victim has to be pure and virtuous in the same way 
to get the outcome, which is come up as my favorite word, come up and of the bad guy, which is really removing him from the situation by killing him or imprisoning him or banishing him. We have to not let any room for doubt there. We have to make Mm -hmm. him entirely bad as well. And it's never that straightforward. I don't think I've ever been involved in any conflict ever where someone was entirely good and someone was entirely bad. Mm -hmm. It makes us feel good, especially if we're casting ourselves in the good role to say the other person's bad, but it shuts down any opportunities for conversation or movement because the I would a nice girl like me talk to someone who's so completely evil. The only thing to do is to protect myself and shut myself off from them until someone comes and gets rid of them. Mm. So it sounds like black and white thinking is a big, big problem then. (laughs) We need to redress that within ourselves in our interpersonal conflicts and in our social (laughs) conflicts as well. (laughs) And Sarah Cobb talks about two shifts. Before we're able to see the benefit of the doubt, I suppose, in the other, we Mm -hmm. have to create some doubt about our own role. And Mm -hmm. again, one of the things that you do as an innocent victim is you avoid talking about anything that you've done. You mentioned this before. The only way you can stay completely innocent is to be completely passive and not do anything because anything you do is open to you know, making a mistake or being interpreted as not perfect. So you have to do as little as possible and distract attention from you doing anything. Then on on the other hand, you point to all the things the other person's done. Asking someone who's in that helpless victim role questions about things that they've done very often results in them answering by suffering. So you say, when he did that terrible thing to you, what did you do? oh, I felt sick, I felt terrible, I was mortified. They respond in feelings, they don't actually tell you what they did. If you can get people to start talking about their past actions without sort of rubbing their nose in it, I suppose, they will sometimes remember or recognise or realise that, yes, maybe their actions haven't always been perfect. And Mm. only then will they be open to giving the benefit of the doubt to the evil villain. So I have a question for you. I feel like I make every podcast about me, actually, because I want everyone to solve my problems while I'm talking with all these experts. It should be called Tipping Laura, the Laura (laughs) Tipping podcast. (laughs) Thing. Oh my goodness, love that. I find that when I'm in a conflict with someone, I'll sit down, even if I'm talking to the third person, and I'll sit down and say, look, this is the situation and these are the things I did wrong. So I'm actually immediately chipping away at my victim credibility. Is that a bad thing, Sam? Should I should I not be doing that? No, I think that's a great thing. It's mm. about balance. I think it's a really important thing. If you can see the things that you've done, if you can notice the ways you've contributed to the situation other than being blameworthy or wrong, mm. you can recognize that. Then that opens up your opportunity to see the other person's contributions, both positive and negative. So I think it's an important step. It, it might mean that you're more advanced than other people or you've not been considering com- conflicts in which you've been really, really stuck in a victim role. Mm. You've allowed yourself to ask yourself what your contributions might have been without worrying too much that that turns you into the evil villain. Okay, well, you reassured me on that front, but... You've also made me want to ask a more provocative question, not about myself this time. I feel I should clarify that. What about, for example, in situations of domestic violence? What if you have someone who's been the victim of domestic violence and they say, well, you know, yeah, sure, they hit me, but, you know, I didn't have their dinner ready on time. At what point is it too much? And how do you sort of judge it, especially as an external party? How do you guide them on a pathway through a conflict like that? I think there's two distinct situations we're talking about here. When I talk about people stuck in a melodramatic story, I'm talking about people whose story is divorced from reality. It's a version of events that doesn't match up with reality. I'm not saying that there's never somebody who is a victim. There are going to be people who are the subject of coercive and controlling behaviours by others and really have little room to move. So that sort of thinking from them is just exacerbating that situation their victimhood so Mm. I guess for me it's a slightly different issue that's about screening very carefully the people that you're working with to ensure that it's not a situation in which they really are the victim of those sort of coercive and controlling behaviors Mm. most of the people I work with are not that's the story they're telling themselves that's the way they think about the situation but when you look at it objectively as an outsider you're like yeah so that person said something to you that was a little bit annoying or hit one of your triggers but doesn't seem to me like they were really out to get you and do some terrible harm to you so I think that's an important distinction I'm not saying that no one is ever a victim I'm also Mm -hmm. not saying that 
there are always things that people who are in a victim type role can do to help themselves because in those coercive controlling behaviours, there may be very little they can do to help themselves and trying to mm -hmm. sell them a version of events or help them reframe their story into one where they're not so victimised is just going to put them at risk of harm. I was thinking more of the situation where they are saying these things and they have this idea that they cause their own victimization, but obviously that's that's untrue. Like they didn't do anything to, to deserve that. I mean, does that actually come up in the sort of situations that you normally coach in? I think that if somebody's in that role where they're buying into the other person's melodrama, when they're mm -hmm. agreeing that they're the villain mm -hmm. and that the other person is the victim, then firstly, they're unlikely to come for support because mm -hmm. they won't see themselves as worthy for support. So they're not the sort of people who turn up asking for my services. But also, they're probably the situations where the kind of coaching model that I'm talking about isn't mm -hmm. going to be effective. It's a sort of a situation where you actually need a melodramatic outcome. You need someone with power to come in and take control of the situation and I think in that case you don't have two competing narratives you have one person who's in control of both people's version of events and they don't actually differ and the person with power is manipulating the other person to believe their narrative so their mm -hmm. own version of events becomes the one that they're being told or they're being forced to agree with for their own physical and psychological safety so it's for me it's not the same kind of conflict of competing stories. That is what I deal with and what I'm more talking about. You know, your view of emotions, because I've been reviewing your course recently. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how you conceptualise emotions and discuss emotions in this course? Laura and I talk about this a lot. We're both big fangirls of Lisa Feldman Barrett, who wrote a yeah. book called How Emotions Are Made. One of the things that I discovered fairly recently is that emotions research in the last 10 to 20 years has developed exponentially often because of increased technology around things like MRIs. We can study a whole lot of things that before we had to make assumptions about and extrapolate from our own experiences. Things have changed so much from what I was taught when I was doing mediation. I psych at university. It was really different back then. And one of the things that really startled me when I read that book is how much of everybody I know is popular assumptions of how emotions work and what we need to do to manage them was yeah. based on all this really outdated research that was either really simplistic or absolutely misguided given recent research. So it's taking a while for popular culture to catch up with the amount of research that's been happening and quality research in the last 10, 20 years. The crux of it for me is there isn't this thing called an emotion and this thing called a thought. In fact, mm -hmm. they're both thoughts. They're both ways of thinking. There may not be as much difference between them as we think. We categorize some sorts of thinking as thinking and some sorts of thinking as feelings, but they're actually using all different bits of the brain. Emotions aren't one bit of the brain and thinking another bit. Both mm -hmm. thinking and emotions, in inverted commas, are using all different bits of the brain. Our brain, when we think or feel, is doing the same thing in both mm -hmm. situations. Biggest distinction that I can come up with, and maybe you can add to this, Laura, is the speed that our emotional thinking tends to happen very quickly. It takes into account different bits of information, bits of sensation, perception, past experiences, memories, little bits of it very quickly to give mm -hmm. us a quick response. Whereas what we think of as thinking does the same thing. We take into yeah. account what's going on, information, past experiences, but maybe it takes a little bit longer and we maybe incorporate a little bit more information into it. For me, that's the distinction between the two. It's really the quantity of processing and the speed. Is that how you see it? What you've just said now really reminds you of Daniel Kahneman's work. So you've got this like really fast thinking, heuristic, takes all kind of shortcuts, ways of processing information, which we would more typically consider emotional. And then the system too, where you're really taking time to seek out information and to mull it over and think about it and plan. I guess I'm less concerned about a difference. I mean, as you know, there's some cultures where there's not actually a linguistic separation between yeah. thinking and feeling, because as you just highlighted yourself, they're both just products of the brain and we just like to label them differently. For me, I guess the important part of emotion is that it is so deeply connected to our body 
The way that Feldman Barrett really talks about emotions is this sort of idea of affect, which is your almost your physical symptoms or your information. So whether from your eyes or your ears or, you know, the internal churning of your intestines and other gruesome stuff, all of that information comes together with your knowledge that you've learned. You've learned that a stomach ache means that maybe you're actually a bit angry at somebody. And then also the context that you're sitting there in a room and your stomach hurts and this person's there and you're like, I might be a bit angry at you. And so for me, that bodily information is really important in sort of how emotions are constructed and how we create them. For me, it's that really visceral component. I find it really interesting that when we talk about nonviolent communication in mediation, one of those principles is separate thoughts from feelings. So it's interesting that we try and actually artificially separate these in a way when we're trying to resolve conflict, whereas in our brains, they're just kind of a big mishmash. And the problem with that is if we just talk about the emotions, particularly if we use those emotion labels that we're familiar with, you know, I was angry, that made me feel angry, that made me feel frustrated. What we lose is the information that we have used to construct that emotion in our mind. Firstly, those labels are very imprecise. They cover very broad categories. They can mean very different things in different situations. If we can try and articulate our thought process underlying the emotions and sometimes recognizing what's happening in our body underlying the emotion, it helps us either clarify and more clearly express our emotion or sometimes realize that it's the wrong emotion that Mm -hmm. helps us revise it. An example of which I was just reminded of that you were just implying in a way there is the hangries, you know, when you're hungry and it's interpreted as angry. The one that is, and again, it's going to a dark place, but It's really interesting that people with PTSD, for example, um, even if their trauma is unrelated to sexual violence, can often be triggered by sexual situations. Because in our body, basically fear and sexual arousal are pretty much doing the same thing. And it's only the context and the knowledge that actually allows us to construct it as being horny, for instance. (laughs) In my survey, people actually wrote that as an emotion. I was like, I accept your labeling, okay? So, you know, are they horny or are they afraid? And it's only that knowledge that allows us to go, well, this is the difference. And I think that really gets to the heart of it. We need to go through and think, well, actually, what am I feeling and why am I misconstructing this? Does this mean that we can actually just feel whatever we want whenever we want to, Sam? Can I just choose to be happy all the time? Is that how that works? (laughs) Oh, wouldn't it be good if it was that easy? Our emotional profile, our habits of feeling certain feelings in certain kinds of situations is created by our experiences. And for me, it's a little bit like exercise. I can just go along and I might tend to have stronger arms and legs because I do a lot of work with my arms and I very rarely use my legs. So I can just by accident strengthen one part rather than the other. And I think the same thing could happen in my emotional profile. I could tend to hang out with people who are angry all the time or I tend to be angry and so I get in the habit of being angry. How I think about it is maybe I can choose to exercise the sorts of emotions that I would like to feel more. Maybe I can go Mm -hmm. looking for activities that will give me opportunities to create those emotions that I want more of and sort of build those emotion muscles within my body so that I can then be less angry because I'm counterbalancing it by doing activities that prompt me to be happy. So I think it's not like I'm just going to turn off my anger and decide to be happy. I think it takes work and practice and building up, actively looking for opportunities to develop those emotions rather than making a decision not to feel that way anymore, exercising the emotions that you would like to have more of. I totally agree. It's like they say, neurons that fire together, wire together. (laughs) And so if you keep using those little happy pathways, of course you're able to create them more. When you were developing your course on emotions and obviously doing all the research, what surprised you the most? I think the biggest surprise for me is how much is out there that Mm -hmm. is directly related to conflict Mm -hmm. that we as conflict resolution practitioners really don't know enough about and that there are so many interventions and things that we can do to support people, not just to manage their emotions, but to work with them. A lot of what we learn in our mediation training is let people vent, remove toxic emotions, encourage people to be as rational as they can, and then you'll get a good outcome. 
I mean, that helps to a certain degree, but there are so many more things we can do. Things like helping people regulate physiological side. I can hear listeners saying, we're not counsellors, we're not psychologists, we're not doctors, we can't give people antidepressants. No, that's true. But there are some basic things that we can do to help people regulate or to help people monitor how they're feeling so that when they engage in conflict conversations, they can be the best they can be. We can help them prepare. We can help them monitor and let us know in the moment if they need a break. I think there's things we can do around people's emotional experience. We can help people understand that an emotion is an experience that has a whole lot of different components, including our past history, our perception of the situation, the context, whether we've had breakfast or a cup of coffee, what's happened to us on the way to the mediation room, how the mediation room looks and feels to uh-huh. us. There's all sorts of things we can do to help people understand their experience and then maybe make a few more conscious choices about how they respond to it rather than just feeling like it's controlling them. Then there's the emotional expression side. That is often what we talk about when we talk about managing emotions. Don't let people yell and scream at each other. It's a very superficial understanding of expression. Again, there's so many things we can do to support people to consciously express their emotion in a nuanced way Mm. or not if it's not appropriate and sometimes it's not but also recognizing the fallacy of this idea that we can understand what someone else is feeling particularly by looking at their facial expression that we're only ever as Lisa Feldman Barrett says we're only ever guessing and we're often guessing by paying attention to the wrong cues or not the most useful cues engaging people in meaningful conversations where they can share with each other descriptions of how they're feeling in nuanced ways can do so much more and then lastly you asked a simple question I'm giving you a very long answer <laughs> Love it. The, yep. the idea of emotional reflection and particularly in my coaching work a lot of what I can do with my clients is to help them reflect on their emotional experiences in the past reflect on the ones that are working for them and the ones that aren't working for them and help them think about things like their emotional profile and strategies that they might want to take in relation to this particular person or this particular situation, but maybe bigger picture strategies to build up the emotion muscles of the emotions they prefer to be feeling. So I just think there's so much we can do that's not just try and stop people from talking over each other and swearing. And because emotion is so much a part of conflict, even if we pretend it's not, it is, Mm. we should be paying attention to it. We should be doing more on it. And it doesn't mean becoming a psychologist or a counsellor. We can do it within the boundaries of our role as a coach or a mediator or whatever. Absolutely. I totally agree. And I think it even extends as well to managers and leaders. Emotional intelligence, we're hearing about it more and more as an essential leadership skill as well. The emotional intelligence term, I heard Susan David talk at a conference recently. She wrote the book, Emotional Agility. Someone asked her, what's the difference between emotional intelligence and emotional agility? And I thought her answer was really powerful. She said, Mm -hmm. you can use emotional intelligence for good or evil. If If you are good at regulating and managing and expressing your own emotions in a way that works for you and you're pretty savvy at interpreting other people's emotions and potentially manipulating them you can use emotional intelligence to become a dictator and build an atomic bomb or to try and promote world peace her take was emotional agility uses emotional intelligence ideas and techniques but it strongly links it to your values so she says Mm. before we start working on our emotions we need to identify our values because Mm -hmm. they should be the foundation of what we do with emotions and I thought mind blown I love it (laughs) I love that I see people bullies in workplaces and those kind of narcissistic personality people you know I know a few of them and they are really smart and emotions but they use it for evil and I thought yes it's so true they're very emotionally intelligent but doesn't mean Mm -hmm. they're nice (laughs) I really like what you said just now in Susan's work on emotional agility define our values first it's really about identifying what our values are and then building our emotions around that. So I think it's a very, a very good point. Yeah, use that. our emotions for the right reasons. Exactly. Which comes back to social conflict. So what is the right reason? How do we decide who's right, who's wrong? This has been a very interesting talk. I feel like we could probably talk all day. Um, but we, we can't do that. Exactly. We'll just have like a week-long podcast where we're just venting. <laughs> I want to say thank you so much for coming today. And I would also really strongly recommend to listeners that 
you do absolutely take a look at Sam's course. I think it's by far the best resource I've seen for mediators, conflict coaches, etc about emotions. It's really cutting edge. And it's lovely. She's got some really nice videos as well. Thank you so much for joining me today, Sam. I hope you'll maybe join me again soon and we can keep ranting. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, this is Laura May with a Conflict Tipping Podcast from Mediate.com. See you next time.